Well, good morning and welcome to Marine View Church Online. My name is Jesse Skiffington and I serve as pastor here at Marine View. And I want to welcome you today as we continue in our journey to go deeper with Jesus and to reach wider with his love. Uh, our current sermon series is exploring the events surrounding the death and the resurrection of Jesus and, uh, and then considering the practical implications for our lives today. At the center of the Christian faith is our trust in Jesus as the risen Lord, that Jesus died and that Jesus really did rise again from the grave, defeating sin and death forever. Without the death and resurrection of Jesus, the, the hope of salvation, the promises of the Bible, all those things disappear. Jesus' death and resurrection are the hinge of history on which the whole story turns and holds together. You could put it this way, and, and this is really the functional title for our current sermon series. Jesus lives, the rest follows. As Christians, we view everything through the lens of Jesus Christ as the Savior who lived and died and rose again, who ascended into heaven and will one day return again. Now, I don't know where you are in the story of your own faith and, and your understanding of all that. But when we see the big picture and how God's story fits together from the very beginning, leading to Jesus' death and resurrection, we get a sense of God's love and his activity toward us. But imagine for a moment what it must have been like for the disciples of Jesus. They were living out the story of salvation in real time. They were coming to terms with who Jesus is and, and what Jesus would mean for their lives and for the world. And they were discovering more and more and learning about what that meant. The disciples of Jesus didn't yet know what we know now. They didn't have the advantage of knowing what we know now through their own experience. They were connecting the dots, if you will, as they went along. They were discovering as they lived this life with Jesus. And as I was thinking about this, the idea of connecting the dots came to mind for me. They were connecting the dots. They were connecting the dots as they followed Jesus, starting to see the picture come into focus, but still struggling to see the whole thing and what it would mean. Now, you may remember uh, doing connect the dot pictures as kids. You remember those where you follow from number to number and eventually a picture appears. And you follow the numbers and connect the dots, and then you saw what the image was, and it finally emerged, one that you couldn't see when it was just dots. I didn't know this, but apparently there are levels of connect-the-dot puzzles, from beginner sort of stuff for kids to advanced to even to expert or extreme connect-the-dot puzzles. Who knew? Uh, here's an example. You can see it on the screen here. Can you guess what this is a picture of? Well, it's impossible to say just looking at all these dots. All the information you need is there, but you can't make sense of it yet until you connect the dots. You need more information. You need the lines to see what the image is. Now connect the dots, and there you have it. Dragonflies. <laughs> That's right. You never would have guessed that, right? I've found that this sometimes happens in my life and faith, even now. I know the story of Jesus, but I often miss it or, or can't see yet completely what God is doing in my life right now, how all the dots connect. It's only afterward, as I look back and reflect, that I can connect the dots and understand how God was and is at work in my life or in me. When you connect the dots, you're able to see the big picture, but often only after the fact. And that brings us to our message this morning and to an event in the life of Jesus that was connecting some of the important dots of God's story of salvation, and yet it wasn't, the story wasn't complete yet. Those with him then, even his own disciples, they couldn't see the full picture yet. There were still more dots to connect before that could happen for them. And so with this image of connecting the dots in mind, let's turn our attention to our scripture passage. We're going to be looking at this together this morning. And on this Sunday in the life of the church, uh, the Sunday before Easter, not only Marine View, but around the world, Christians celebrate what we call Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday marks the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem to shouts of praise, celebration from the crowds that were gathering there too. Uh, and they were ready to welcome Jesus as a king. John's gospel tells us that the people took palm branches and went out to meet him, a, a, a sign of celebration and royal welcome. In Matthew and Mark's gospels, we see that the crowds also placed their cloaks and, and some of the branches on the ground for Jesus as he made his way to Jerusalem, kind of a, a red carpet for him to follow into the city. Each gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, records the account of Jesus entering Jerusalem as a triumphant king on his way to the cross. And today we're going to look at this, uh, this Sunday, Palm Sunday, uh, 
and consider the account of this event as told in Luke's gospel. So we're going to look at Luke's gospel specifically. So if you have your Bible, open up to the gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke uh, chapter 19, verses 28 and following, as Luke records his account based on the eyewitness testimony of those who were there and had experienced this event for themselves. So I'm going to read this account uh, from Luke, and then we're going to unpack it together and uh, talk about what it might mean for our lives today. So this is what Luke writes. Uh, he says, after Jesus had said this, he's just done some teaching, and gave a parable. Uh, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So there is Luke's account of Palm Sunday. Here is Jesus entering into Jerusalem. We know that it's on his way to the cross. But did you notice here in Luke's gospel a missing detail that we find in the other uh, uh, other uh, Gospels, Luke uh, doesn't mention what John does, the palm branches. Instead, he focuses on the cloaks that were used to create this, this red carpet of sorts for Jesus, a, a robe worthy for a king as he approached Jerusalem. Now, before we get to application, let's, let's first put Palm Sunday into context. We're going to do that in several, several ways. We're going to look first at how this fits into Luke's gospel as a whole. Where does Palm Sunday fit in Luke's understanding of Jesus and, and the story of Jesus? Then we're going to look at something of the religious and political climate in Jerusalem at the time. And finally, we're going to consider the larger biblical context of the people's longing for a Messiah, for God's promised king to come. So all of that is going to form our, our understanding of this event and then how it applies to us. So first... Let's put it into the context of Luke's gospel. Luke is one of the four gospel writers. Luke is a physician, a historian. He's a follower of Jesus. Most scholars agree that, uh, that Luke was not Jewish, but came from a family of God-fearing Greeks. And at the outset of his gospel, Luke declares that he is setting out to record an orderly account of what the eyewitnesses saw, heard, and experienced those who had been with Jesus in person. And so he states that he has carefully investigated everything from the beginning. And now he's going to offer his account uh, based on eyewitness testimony. So Luke begins with the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus. And he provides an account of Jesus' infancy. And uh, it's the only gospel that includes an account in Jesus' early childhood years before he moves into Jesus' baptism and, and by John in the Jordan River and the beginnings of Jesus' ministry as, a, as a, uh, an adult. And so we get to hear from Luke something the beginning and then we get to hear uh, as Jesus begins to teach and do miracles and some of the dots begin to emerge about who Jesus really is. That Jesus is a savior sent into the world, uh, the promised king. We're, we're beginning to wonder and when Luke gets about halfway through his gospel, he makes a statement about Jesus that represents something of a turning point. In Luke 9 51, Luke writes, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Resolutely. That word resolute shows a determined mind, a committed direction. Another way to translate that same verse is, is something like this, that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. His focus moved to the cross and to the purpose for which God had sent him into the world. And from that point forward in Luke, again and again, Luke uses the phrase, on his way to Jerusalem, or and as Jesus as, and his disciples were on their way, we see this uh, throughout the rest of Luke. And if you go back and read Luke, this phrase, on his way to Jerusalem, will jump out at you again and again. For Luke, Jesus is set on his course, his direction, on this road to the cross, and more and more dots appear 
They appear through his teaching and his actions, dots that the disciples will eventually put together after his death and resurrection about who he is, what he came to do and to be for us. So finally in Luke 19, Jesus reaches the city of Jericho. It's an oasis in the desert which travelers would have stopped at on their way to Jerusalem uh, from the various places they were coming. They would walk down the Jordan River Valley and go through Jericho and then up into Jerusalem. Jericho was an ancient city, one of the lowest cities on earth by altitude, about 846 feet or so below sea level. And there Jesus encountered a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus. And he's on his way to Jerusalem, but Jesus makes time for Zacchaeus. And, and Zacchaeus' life has changed as Jesus declares, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Who would have thought tax collectors could be included back in? He said, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, reiterates the purpose for which he came into the world through his encounter with Zacchaeus. He came to seek and to save what was lost. And then Jesus began the ascent. He walked the steep road up from Jericho to the city of Jerusalem. Today, the road up to Jericho, uh, to, from Jericho to Jerusalem covers about 17 miles, climbs about 3,600 feet. In Jesus' time, the road took him to the towns of Bethany and Bethpage, just outside of Jerusalem, leading to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a mountain of sorts, uh, sitting opposite of the holy city of Jerusalem. And travelers to Jerusalem would pass along the side of the mountain before descending down into the Kidron Valley, which separated the Mount of Olives from the city of Jerusalem. Here's a map of approximately the path that Jesus and his disciples probably would have followed that first Palm Sunday. You see them, they're making their way along, uh, up from Jericho, along the side of the Mount of Olives and down into the city. Um, they would have been able to see the ancient city Jerusalem and the temple from the Mount of Olives. So here's a modern view from the Mount of Olives looking back towards Jerusalem. Certainly would have been a different in Jesus' time. The Dome of the Rock Mosque here that you see pictured, uh, that would have been the Jewish temple instead. That's what Jesus would have been seeing with his disciples. And then looking back from Jerusalem, here's a picture of the Mount of Olives. That uh, You can see the hill rising, and this is the, this direction from the Mount of Olives. The, Jesus and his disciples traveled down. And when Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem after the Last Supper, this is the direction they would have gone in, into the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus, of course, would be betrayed by Judas and arrested. So you get something of, of the scene there. Uh, the religious climate of Jerusalem uh, pitted two primary camps of religious leaders against one another in the Jewish Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was where uh, the, the religious leaders governed the people. And there were the Pharisees who were strict on their adherence to the law of Moses. They were adamant about the resurrection of the dead at the end of days. And then there were the Sadducees who were less focused on the spiritual and more focused on the practicalities of a life in Jerusalem. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And both groups were often at odds with each other, but both found disagreement with Jesus. And in the end, they would both share a desire to remove Jesus by conspiring together to put him to death. There were also zealots uh, who were ready to fight against Rome, restore Israel to its rightful place. All of them were looking for a Messiah, though from different perspectives and with different motivations and ends in mind. And it's probable that each of these groups were present in some way in the crowd that was gathering in Jerusalem. So we get something of the religious climate and the tensions between these groups. The political climate was also tense. There was King Herod, the puppet of the, uh, the Roman Empire, that, but it was the king of the Jewish people, kind of in name only, and he answered to Rome and to the Roman governor Pilate, and there was the Roman governor Pilate and his need to control the people and quell any outbreaks of violence. And so the religious leaders were pulled between their desire to see Roman rule in Israel come to an end and something of their desire to keep the peace with Rome and not stir up trouble. When the crowds gathered in Jerusalem for the various religious festivals throughout the year and the celebrations, there was always the prospect for an uprising or maybe for a self-proclaimed Messiah to arrive on the scene and cause a disruption and cause the Romans to come down hard on the people. They were living this balance between their desire to see the Messiah come and keeping peace with the Romans. For hundreds of years, the people of God have been scanning the horizon for the promised Messiah. And now, at last, in this account, we see Jesus riding in Jerusalem. It seemed that many believed that perhaps the promised king had come at last. And it was down this road from the Mount of Olives, in the context of his journey to the cross, amidst the religious disputes of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire, that Jesus sent for a donkey. 
I love this part of the story. Uh, Jesus sends for a donkey. The disciples, when they get the donkey, they place Jesus on the colt, the fold of a donkey, and he approaches the downward path from the Mount of Olives going down into the Kidron Valley before going into Jerusalem. And it's there that the people begin to respond by placing their cloaks in the road and shouting with praise to God about what they're seeing and experiencing. So one more bit of context to add, and it comes from this question, what's the deal with the donkey? Why did Jesus send for a donkey, and what, if anything, does this donkey represent? Was it just a means of transportation? Jesus is tired, spent a long journey up from Jericho, or, or is there something more? Well, to answer that question, we go back to the Old Testament, to the Hebrew Scriptures, and to the section of the Bible that we call the Minor Prophets. Some of our community groups are, are studying the Minor Prophets right now, and they're going to uh, look at this, uh, this book in the Old Testament, too. And among them is the book of Zechariah. Zechariah was written after the Jewish people returned from exile in Babylon, and as God spoke to the people through Zechariah, he pointed forward to the Messiah God would send, and something of a sign that they would be able to tell that God had sent this Messiah to rescue his people and to reign over all the earth. And right at the heart of this message about this, this future king, this Messiah to come, Zechariah wrote these words. He wrote, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now we see the importance of the donkey, don't we? The donkey was not a war horse. It wasn't a big stallion going off to battle, but rather a symbol of humility and peace. The, the king was returning in peace. The victory had been won. The time of peace that would come with him after the victory had been accomplished. And as Jesus climbed on the donkey, and, and as he was placed there, after performing miracles, after raising the dead, after teaching with authority, and casting out demons, and after proclaiming that the kingdom of God had come near, the people took this moment as a sign. Surely, this is the promised king. This is the Messiah of Zechariah's prophecy. And the scriptures are finally being fulfilled. And they began to sing. And they began to sing a song fit for a king. The words they sang came from Psalm 118. Familiar words of celebration at the return of a king, accompanied by shouts of, The Lord saves and Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. The crowd joyfully praised God in song and lifted their voices in anticipation of what they believed Jesus had come to do. They believed that the dots were connecting that they could see the big picture now, that the Messiah had come at last to overthrow Rome and to reestablish Israel as a power in the world. Now, Luke gives us one additional piece uh, that is unique here. The shouts of praise include a refrain, a refrain that reminds us of the angel song at Jesus' birth. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Remember, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, glory in the highest. Here in Luke, the Christmas announcement announcing the birth of the Savior, the newborn king, is revisited. And it's little wonder that the disciples were overjoyed and that the crowds joined it with them in their revelry and their anticipation of who Jesus was and what Jesus would do for them and, and, and establishing God's kingdom forever as he came into Jerusalem. But the Pharisees weren't so sure, were they? We saw in the passage there that they told Jesus, hey, tell your disciples to keep it down. Now, maybe they were concerned about the tense religious and political climate. Another supposed Messiah that might stir up trouble, so hey, keep it down. Or maybe it was their opposition to Jesus and his teaching and the way he pointed out the flaws in their legalism that they didn't like, and they're like, hey, knock it off. Whatever the case, it's clear that the Pharisees don't like what they're seeing, and they don't like the noise that it's creating, and so they say, Jesus, tell your people to be quiet. But Jesus' reply tells, them, uh, tells us what we need to know. He said, if they keep quiet, creation itself is going to cry out. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is here whether you're ready or not. Now, on Palm Sunday, as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, Jesus gets the royal treatment, doesn't he? He is treated as the coming king. The carpet is laid out. He is welcomed with shouts of praise. But what the disciples didn't know, and what the crowds didn't and couldn't know, is that there were still a lot of dots that needed to be connected. This was just one part of the bigger picture of God's plan of salvation. Yes, they were right. Jesus is the long-expected king. And yet, as they'll find out soon, Jesus is the king no one actually expected. No one expected a king whose kingdom would not be of this world. 
No one expected a king who would not ride at the head of an earthly army. No one expected a king, a savior, a Messiah who would seek to serve, not to be served, who would give his life as a ransom for many. No one expected a king who would suffer and die for the world he loved. No one expected a king, a Messiah, who would be crucified on a Roman cross. And so while the crowds shouted Hosanna and praised God in loud voices, Luke tells us that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He knew that they would miss it about him and about the kingdom of God that he came to proclaim. Jesus knew the road that was before him. It was only his death that would lead to life. And that, that life would be not just for one people, but for all who would place their faith and trust in him as Lord. And so in the midst of the celebration, Jesus steadfastly, resolutely set his face toward the cross. The dots were still being connected, and those around him could not see what he could see. Now, Luke, of course, is recording the eyewitness accounts of the disciples and the others who were there. And their understanding as the story unfolds. And, of course, we're going to see the ups and downs that are going to come for them. One who was there and experienced this firsthand was a man named John. John is one of the four gospel writers, one of Jesus' closest followers. He's the one that records about the palm branches. He's a disciple and a friend of Jesus. And John, like Luke, is, writes this account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's in John's gospel that we hear that the disciples still didn't see the big picture. They couldn't see it all yet. They were still connecting the dots that first Palm Sunday. John writes, At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after, only after Jesus was glorified, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. See, we see Palm Sunday in a different light than the disciples did, and certainly than the crowds gathering in Jerusalem did. Only afterward did they fully understand. For the disciples, this joy of this moment would grow dim against the backdrop of what is about to come. It was as if they were working with a portion of the picture complete, but they couldn't see it all yet. Soon their expectations and hopes, like many, we would find they were right about Jesus on the one hand. Jesus is the Messiah, the promised king, but they were incomplete. They didn't have the advantage that we have of the bigger picture. But we have that benefit. We have the benefit of the dots being connected after the fact. We get to see Palm Sunday for what it actually is, the celebration of Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. He really is the Messiah, the promised king that God would send. We know that there's more to come in the gospel, that it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we know that unless a kernel of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus' death will lead to life. And as Christians, we celebrate Palm Sunday. We celebrate with joy and palms and praise because we have the cross and the resurrection in view. We know that without death, there is no resurrection. Jesus invites us to, to come and die and find that we might truly live. Sometimes on Palm Sunday, we end with something of a Good Friday kind of feel. We move our attention to the cross and to Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. And we're going to take some time to reflect on that some more this coming week on Friday. Uh, and Good Friday, we're going to have an in-person service at 7 o'clock p.m. We'd love to have you be there. We're going to share communion and reflect on the cross. And uh, we're going to wrestle with why we call it Good Friday. Because we know that Friday is hard, but Sunday's coming. Today, as we come to the end of the message, I want you, as, as best you can, to think about the big picture. To connect the dots like the disciples were able to do for themselves as they looked back on the whole of Jesus' story. And if there's a place where you struggle to see the big, big picture in your own life and faith, I'm going to invite you to reflect on, on that as well. See, in the church year, we call this week Holy Week. Holy Week. It's set apart. It's, it's a time where we get our hearts ready to celebrate the good news that Jesus is alive, that Jesus lives, and that we can trust him as our Lord and Savior. For Christians down through the centuries... And for followers of Jesus today, you and I, right now, today, Holy Week is an opportunity for reflection and for prayer. It is a week where we are invited to set aside time to reflect and to consider who Jesus is, what Jesus means for our lives. It's a time to think and pray and 
about how things are going in our own life and faith as followers of Jesus and to set aside a, a, a time to do that in a, in a really intentional way. And so for our application today, as we come to the end of our Palm Sunday message, it is exactly that. That's what I want you to do. I invite you to do that this week. Spend this week reflecting on your faith. Spend time in prayer. Grab a notepad or a journal and, or maybe your notes app on your phone and jot down thoughts and, uh, as they come. And just reflect on how are things going. Spend time in prayer, listening, talking with the Lord. And as you do, maybe here's three questions that I think maybe will be a good starting place to help you get that going. Or maybe you can come up with your own as well. So I just want to give you these three starter questions and feel free to add to those or to use different questions for your reflection and prayer this week. But the first question maybe is this, how is your relationship with Jesus going so far this year? In other words, how's your faith? Are you growing? Are you feeling stuck or stagnant? Are you feeling disconnected from God? Are you feeling connected to God? Maybe you're not sure about Jesus yet and you're wondering about that. When I lived in and worked in San Antonio, Texas, one of my good friends went to a Baptist college with students from all over Central and South America. And whenever I was on campus or spending time with them, they would always ask a question like, how's your faith, brother? And I invite you to ask that question for yourself this week. How's my faith? How's my relationship with Jesus? The second question maybe could be this. How are you doing at understanding where the dots connect in God's story? How are you doing at seeing the dots connecting and the big picture? Think about your knowledge and understanding of the Bible and how it all fits together. Is that an area where you need to grow and invest time to understand it more? The Bible tells the big picture story of God's love, how he created us for relationship with himself, how we became disconnected from him, and the lengths to which God goes to get us back, and what we can expect to happen in the end, all because of God's love for us. The Bible, in the end, is a love story, and it answers the basic human questions about who we are and about the meaning of life. How are you doing it, connecting the dots in God's story? Is that a place where you need to invest? Third and finally, um, and I'm sure, again, like I mentioned, you can think of other questions to include, and I would encourage you to, to do that. But maybe you ask a question, something like this. Is there a place in your life where God may be up to something that you just can't see yet? Is there an area of life where it's hard for you to see the big picture of what God is doing? Is there a place in your life right now where you're like the disciples that first Palm Sunday, you don't have all the information yet, and you're still waiting to see what will happen in the end? It's, not, it's often not until we can look back and reflect that we see how God was at work in our lives or our circumstances. It can be difficult to see that in the heat of the moment. So reflect on that this week. Is there a place where you don't see where the dots connect yet. I want you to remind yourself that God loves you. God is faithful. And that there is more to the story waiting to be written in your life with him. Okay, so that's just a couple of questions to help you get started on prayer and reflection this week. This Holy Week, I want you to do that. I want to invite you to reflect and to pray and to prepare your heart to celebrate the good news that Jesus is alive. And as we wrap up today, I want to invite you again to Good Friday and Easter services as I mentioned, we're going to be in person for Good Friday at 7 p.m. There's not going to be an online version of that, so my apologies if you're not able to make that in person. But then we'll be back together again on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. for our in-person Easter services. And again, if you're not able to be with us on Easter morning in person, the Easter message will be right here available for you online. So however you're celebrating Easter, Holy Week this year, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us see how the dots connect in the story of his love for us. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the time that we get to spend understanding more of your love for us and how all the pieces of the story fit together. And so, Lord, in those places where we need to uh, invest more deeply in our relationship with you, to, to see our faith revitalized in some way, would you meet us there as we think about how our relationship with you is going? Lord, help us to know your story, to see how the dots connect. And if that's an area where we need to grow, Lord, help us to take the steps to to learn, to discover your story as, as you tell it in scripture and as you reveal yourself to us in that. And Lord, if there's a place in our lives, a, a hard place, maybe something we're going through and it's hard to see how the dots are connected and to see where at, you're at work and, and all of that, help us to trust you in the midst of that, that there's more to the story to come and that when we look back and we can see your hand in our lives, you can see your presence in the ways that you are at work. So help us to trust you, Lord. Trust your faithfulness and your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we've shared together today. Bless us as we spend time this week reflecting and praying. 
And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, 